Thank you very much for having me here. I was actually a student at the Laugh G'day Summer School in Perth in 2010, so it's quite a pleasure to be back here now as a lecturer. And I'm going to be talking about all things biogeochemistry, really. So, as you know, you were meant to have um, two talks from Amala Mahadavan introducing biogeochemical modelling on Saturday, but unfortunately she couldn't be here. So instead I will dedicate much of my first lecture to introducing biogeochemical modelling. I don't know exactly what Amala was planning to say, and it won't be as detailed as Amala would have given you, but hopefully it will be a general overview that will lead into the rest of my talk. So, yeah, today I will start with some general motivation for why we want to forecast biogeochemistry, introduce the modelling aspect of biogeochemistry, and then talk about how that feeds into operational forecasting and reanalysis. Then tomorrow I will talk about data simulation and a little bit about biophysical feedbacks. So, I will first of all clarify the scope though. So, we're talking here about biogeochemistry, which is the cycling of elements through the Earth system, here the ocean, so carbon, nutrient, and other things. So, in terms of life, we're generally considering plankton, phytoplankton, and zooplankton, things like fish and marine mammals, whilst important for other reasons aren't so important for kind of elemental cycling, so don't get considered under biogeochemistry. However, there are groups looking at modelling and operational prediction of a wider marine ecosystem, but I will do no more than touch on that in this presentation. And in a G'day context, all of these activities are we collaborate together as part of a marine ecosystem analysis and prediction task team, which you can find the details of on the G'day website. So, for motivation why we care about biogeochemistry, one reason, to quote the final line of a paper by Odor et al. a few years back, the ocean provides half the oxygen you breathe. Would you like to have to breathe twice as often? Which, what they mean by that is that approximately half of the primary production on Earth happens in the ocean. So all of the plant life, all the greenery you see around you on land, they've just as much again in the ocean, so it's probably important. As for why we might want to forecast aspects of it, I've got a theory of motivations here, which I've split up into short, medium and long range, although, frankly, a lot of those distinction for slightly arbitrary, and these apply across a range of time scales. So you get huge algal blooms sometimes, which are visible from space. Some of these can be harmful to human health, either directly or indirectly through fisheries and shellfish. Others may not be actively harmful, but could be considered a nuisance, such as Theophistis, which forms large colonies, these then die, decay, get whipped up by the waves and cause the foam that you often see on beaches and can also clog up boat engines and generally be a nuisance. But at the same time, algae, phytoplankton are the base of the marine food chain, uh, provide food for fish, and so if you're interested in fisheries or aquaculture, you want to know where the plankton are. But plankton aren't the only thing in the ocean. They're sediment, colour dissolved organic matter, which affects the visibility. So if you're wanting to get in the water for diving operations, either recreational or commercial or naval, you would like to know what the visibility is and will be in the near future. And also, some plankton bioluminesce species of dinoflagellates. So, when they're disturbed, they produce their own light and light up. And they do that when disturbed by predators, but also when disturbed by a boat or a submarine. So, if you're in the business of not wanting to be seen, you don't want to suddenly be lit up for everyone to see. So, you might want to know where such plankton are. Then on a slightly longer time scale, so 
phytoplankton, as I said, provide food for fish, but they have large seasonal variability and also interannual variability, so it would be quite helpful to be able to predict their whereabouts on a seasonal timescale, because they vary with various climate drivers. And we can use that kind of information to map potential habitat, which can feed into longer-term planning for fisheries, catch quotas, things like that. There's also the issue of eutrophication. So nutrients can run off from farms, come down rivers, and that can fuel large algal blooms, which themselves can cause problems. But again, they then die, decay, starving the water of oxygen, which can cause hypoxia and mass death of fish. And then, on all timescales, really, there's increasingly policy and legislation. So in the European Union, there's the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which commits the nations to monitoring and maintaining good environmental status for their waters. And there's the Water Quality Directive, Common Fisheries Policy, and then other countries increasingly have their own legislation that we need to comply with and be confident that we will be complying with in the future. Then longer range. There can be long-term environmental change. The ecosystem is even static. For instance, you can get what are known as regime shifts. So you can see here an example in the North Sea. So we have several decades of data from a continuous plankton recorder, and that showed from 1950 to the late 1980s a consistent pattern, a spring bloom, then an autumn bloom. But quite suddenly, in the late 1980s, all of that changed and got a very different amount of plankton and seasonal cycle. And that can be related to changes in North Atlantic circulation, which quite suddenly produced a whole new ecosystem which has maintained since. So we would like to be able to understand and perhaps even predict this. Then, of course, one of the big challenges facing everyone is climate change. So a big reason for looking at marine biochemistry is to study the ocean carbon cycle, see how this varies naturally, and try and project how it might change into the future under different emission scenarios. But with increasing carbon dioxide being taken up by the ocean, it reacts with the water, and that leads to a lowering of pH, which can lead to ocean acidification, which could have potentially large impact on marine life. So those are just some of the reasons why we want to model and predict biogeochemistry. So the question now is how we go about doing that. So you heard last week that for physics, we basically know the equations that we want to solve, the Navier-Stokes equations. The big issue is how we solve them. For biogeochemistry, we don't have the luxury of knowing the equations we want to solve, so we have to figure out the equations first and then try and solve them as well. And we also heard last week various quotes about modelling, for instance, George Box's fame of all models are wrong, but some are useful. I'm going to add one more to that. People don't understand the Earth, but they want to, so they build a model. And then they have two things they don't understand. <laughs> but we'll try here to understand. So the most simple, kind of classical form of a biogeochemical model is the NPZD model, standing for nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detritus. And you can see one schematically here. And I will come back to the various linkages between these. But firstly, to clarify what I mean by plankton, so these are any organisms living in a body of water which are unable to swim against the current. That doesn't necessarily mean they can't swim at all, just not against the dominant currents in the ocean. And a whole host of organisms come under the definition of plankton, but generally we're considering tiny, microscopic, often single-celled organisms. And for our modelling, we consider 
phytoplankton, so the algae at the base of the food chain who get their energy from the sun through photosynthesis, and then zooplankton, the tiny animals that feed on them and then are eaten by fish and whales. So in our MPVD model, we have phytoplankton, zooplankton, and nutrients, and then detritus, which is basically a bit of poop and dead things, to put it that way. And so biochemical models will have one or more currencies, most, currently, most commonly nitrogen, but also potentially carbon, phosphorus, silicon, iron, or chlorophyll. And each of the state variables are modelled as dissolved concentrations of one of these currencies. So we don't consider individual organisms, we consider basically passive traces. And as such, the equation for each state variable, basically of a form, we have to consider physical circulation, so advection and diffusion, and then well, that's not meant to happen. OK, so advection, diffusion, and then what we term fourth minor sink terms, which is basically the biogeochemistry, which is what the biogeochemical model does. But for the advection and diffusion, we require a physical model for the passive tray for transport, as well as potentially feeding into other biogeochemical processes. And we can either couple the physics and biogeochemistry online and integrate them together with information passed at every time step. Or we can force the biogeochemistry offline, so run the physics first, save the necessary outputs, and then run the biogeochemical model at our leisure. So with our MPZD model, so we have four state variables here. In each case, for a typical MPZD model, each is a quantity of dissolved nitrogen. And as I say, we don't know the equations that we need to model, but we do know the basic processes that we are trying to model. So for phytoplankton, they increase by photosynthesizing, which takes up nutrients and so grow, which is known as primary production. And then they decrease by being eaten by zooplankton, which is grazing, and then others will come just die for other reasons. And zooplankton, in the very simplest form, will increase by grazing on phytoplankton and decrease by either being eaten by fish or whales, which we just parameterize, or again through natural mortality. Then detritus that will increase from glossy folk and death and excretion from both phytoplankton and zooplankton, then decrease by being graved on by zooplankton, by remineralization, which is when it's broken down by bacteria or other processes and returns to nutrients and also by gravitational sinking to the deep ocean, which is a major source of carbon storage. And then our nutrients, some of that will increase directly through losses from phytoplankton and zooplankton, as well as remineralization of detritus. And then they will decrease through primary production being taken up by phytoplankton. And there are all kinds of ways we can model these different terms that I don't have time to go into here. But if you want to know more, there's various textbooks. And this one, Ocean Biochemical Dynamics by Sarmiento and Gruber, is one I found particularly useful. And you can then see all of these links schematically here. OK. So that's kind of nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton, detritus. But I guess what many of you might be most familiar with for biogeochemistry is chlorophyll, or more specifically, chlorophyll A, because that's the dom dominant product you get from ocean color. And it's the green pigment you get in phytoplankton as well as plants on land that is required for photosynthesis. And because it's required for photosynthesis, we need to include it in our models.
There are basically two ways for doing that. Simplest way is to simply derive it diagnostically as a fixed ratio to the nitrogen or carbon content of the phytoplankton. The more realistic way is to allow it to vary. You can give it its own state variable and let it vary depending on the amount of light, the temperature and the nutrients available. And light, temperature and nutrients are the kind of three things that limit pr primary production. And so it's particularly important to have a variable carbon chlorophyll ratio to model what's known as a deep chlorophyll maximum. So what we've got here is a time series of eight years of observation for the Bermuda Atlantic time series site from the North Atlantic. So you can see primary production, it all happens at the surface of the ocean because you need light for photosynthesis. So that's where all the biology is happening, really. And you can see strong seasonal cycles, so kind of spring bloom, over an autumn bloom, depending on kind of light and nutrients. The nutrients here, nitrate, it's beneath the kind of mixed layer depth, there's a lot of nutrients. But within the mixed layer, you generally get much lower nutrients because once they're there in the euphotic zone where both synthesis can occur, they tend to get used up by whatever phytoplankton there are. And you can see you sometimes get injection through mixing into the mixed layer, and these will fuel primary production. But what well, you'll see all the primary production happening at the surface in terms of chlorophyll, you often actually get a maximum fitting just below the base of a mixed layer. And here you have plenty of nutrients and what's less light, still enough light for photosynthesis. And so whilst you don't necessarily get more biomass here, you get a lot more chlorophyll here as the phytoplankton vary their chlorophyll in order to best take advantage of these conditions. And this can be, as you saw last week, a few times the order of magnitude to what's happening at the surface, and you can't really see that from space. And then, so you can add that, you can also add other things, such as a carbon cycle, which I don't really have time to go into in detail here, but it has both a kind of physical and a biological component. So you might have heard of a solubility pump, carbon getting dissolved, come through air through CO2 flux and transported to the deep ocean, and a biological pump where it's taken up by phytoplankton and the phytoplankton or to try to sink to the deep ocean. We consider both of those, integrate them together. And in terms of state variables, it involves adding dissolved inorganic carbon, which is a form in which 90% of the carbon in the ocean is stored, and alkalinity, which is a measure of the capacity of seawater to neutralize an acid. And so once we add these things, you get to a model such as Haddock, which we use quite a lot for global climate studies at the Met Office. And again, you can see that schematically there, kind of at the base of it, an MPZD model, but a variable carbon to chlorophyll ratio. <laughs> ah, excuse me. <laughs> and a fully coupled carbon cycle, and I'll put that down now. But you may notice that what we've been doing here is grouping all, phyto all um, photosynthesizing algae into one single model variable which isn't necessarily that bad if you just want to consider total primary production, but obviously you're grouping a whole range of species and organisms into one single variable. And phytoplankton vary considerably, both in size and function. So, as stated by a paper by Finklet et al. in 2010, phytoplankton rage in size in terms of cell volume over nine orders of magnitude which is a huge range. So they show that schematically here and then helpfully add a similar range of macroscopic scales going all the way from a fish right up to Manhattan, which apart from potentially describing Godzilla's diet throughout its life cycle, gives you an idea that 
possibly these different organisms play different roles in the ecosystem. And size in particular is very important because if you have small organisms, you generally have a longer food chain because you've got smaller organisms feeding on them, more links until you get up to fish. And because you've had more links, there's probably less biomass in terms of the top predators. Whereas with larger plank plankton, you may have much fewer links in the food chain, so different fish available and more of them. So that's important to consider. And so we might want to separate the plankton out into what are known as plankton functional types or PFTs. The simple initial step you can do, which is taken by models such as Medusa and also Pifkev, which is bundled with Nemo, is to just separate out initially a diatom from a phytoplankton. These are a particular type of phytoplankton which form silicate shells and so think much faster than other phytoplankton. So play an important role in the export of carbon to the deep ocean. So in models come view for climate studies, these are generally the first ones to be separated out. So you've got diatoms and then all the rest non-diatoms. And you also have to add more nutrients, so you've still got our nitrogen nutrient but also need a silicon nutrient because diatoms make silicate shells, so need to take up silicate. And we also add iron, which limits production in various areas of the world ocean. It also introduces what's known as variable stoichiometry. So if you look at diatoms, these are now described by not just one state variable, but three. So you have one describing their nitrogen content, one describing their chlorophyll content, and one describing their silicon content, all of which the ratio for those different elements are allowed to vary. We also have their carbon content, but that's come dotted on here because that's diagnosed as a fixed ratio to the nitrogen content, so that just changes with nitrogen, so it doesn't need its own state variable. And then Medusa also adds two types of zooplankton, two types of detritus, faster flow thinking, and oxygen as well as carbon cycle. So we get up to 15 state variables here. But we can go further than that. A commonly used, fairly complex model is Earthum. And so this, you now have four different phytoplankton types three different zooplankton, um, bacteria, five different nutrients, so iron, silicate, phosphate, and nitrogen is now separated into nitrate and ammonium. Also have come different detritus, both a pelagic, so that's the water column ecosystem, and a benthic ecosystem, which is the kind of seabed ecosystem. And in conversion 15.06 of that, if you turn on all of the options, you suddenly find yourself with 95 state variables. So these models can get really quite expensive to run. OK, so that's a kind of general overview of the basics of biochemical modelling. Obviously, we're here talking about operational oceanography, and we are, whilst it's less mature than physics, starting to use these models for operational forecasting. And I will start with an example of what we do at the Met Office for our shelf fees forecasting system. So you can find available from CMEMS um, analyses and forecasts from our system which covers the Northwest European Shelf Thief, also known as the Atlantic Meridional Margin. And this is basically the shelf fees around Northern Europe and the adjacent off-shelf regions. And we provide CMEMS every day an analysis and a six-day forecast of chlorophyll, phytoplankton carbon biomass, net primary product productivity, nitrate, 
phosphate, dissolved oxygen, light attenuation, and temperature, salinity, currents, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And we do this using the beef that I showed earlier, which is earth um, coupled with the NEMO hydrodynamic model. And these are coupled online, so integrated together. And so we have basically the same consideration for operational forecasting that's been discussed for physics. In particular, we've got a regional domain. So we have a set of nested physics models so our AMM domain is currently seven kilometers. It will be moving to one and a half kilometers. This takes its boundary conditions every day from our operational 12th of a degree North Atlantic model, which in turn takes its boundary condition from our quarter of a degree global model. And then each of these take their surface boundary condition from our 10 kilometer global atmosphere model. And that's the physics. For biogeochemistry, we're only running a biogeochemical model operationally in our regional shelf eave domain. So at the moment, the boundary conditions and rivers from that are just taken from climatology. So that's something we'll look to change in the future. So running the system each day, we start with our observation from various sources our initial conditions, which is the previous day's analysis, and our boundary conditions. These go into the observation operator step. So as you heard yesterday, you need to do a comparison between your model and the observation to feed into the data simulation. We do this running the model, physics and biogeochemistry coupled online. This then feeds into our data simulation scheme, which is the 3D VAR, NEMO VAR scheme. At the moment, we're only doing operationally a simulation of physical data, not of any biochemical data. But we have developed a scheme to simulate ocean color data, which I will talk more about tomorrow. And that will become operational at a future upgrade of the model. And so from that, we get our simulation increment. And then we run the model again, adding in our increment to create the analysis. From this, we can run our six-day forecast and create the products that go to both CMEMS and other customers. And then the analysis forms the initial condition for the next day forecast. And we also have our own internal monitoring system so we can look at all the variables, check everything how it should be, there aren't any problems, as well as publishing some validation of this statistics on a regular basis. So that's where we do have a Met Office. We're not alone in doing biochemical forecasting. In particular, within CMEMS, you can get biochemical forecasts for all of the same regions that you can get physical forecasts for. And within CMEMS, things are fairly standardized. So most of the systems take a fairly similar approach. But there are differences in approach, particularly since you can couple the biogeochemistry offline. So one example is the Mediterranean Sea forecasting system. This is run twice per week with a simulation of ocean color data once a week. Um, but each time it's run, it does six days of hindcast and then a 10-day forecast. And this comes about through its kind of offline coupling with a physical model. So the physical Mediterranean forecasting system is run every day, producing a 10-day forecast. Those outputs are then saved, and as I say, twice a week, the biogeochemistry is run, catches up to present day, and runs its own 10-day forecast. And the main reason for doing it that way are kind of spread the computational cost, because like I say, these models are expensive to run. But there is also an attraction in having a kind of separation of concerns. So if your biogeochemical model fails, it doesn't bring down your physical model, for instance. And then there's other places around the world doing, I have to say, more looking at wider ecosystem forecasting than biochemical forecasting. I actually just came across this review paper yesterday, published last month, looking at various different marine ecosystem forecasts produced 
I mean, around the world, but this is mostly happening in the USA, Canada, and Australia, where th those are the three countries who most provide kind of ecosystem forecast feeding into policy. And yeah, there's a range of approaches, and it's increasingly becoming something that operational centers are focused on. So, as well as operational forecasting, we can do reanalysis. So, Keith Haynes gave a talk about physical reanalysis last week, and the same general principles apply equally well to biogeochemical reanalysis. And so, whilst obviously there's a very thing you have to consider about stability, freezing your model, consistency of observations that Keith was talking about, you can basically apply your operational system back in time to produce reanalysis, which is what we do for our Shell C system, and again is available via Copernicus. And with our as with our operational system, um, the version currently available only has a simulation of sea surface temperature data, but we are currently running a new reanalysis of simulating ocean colour data, and that will be available early next year. And you can look at the output, do various validation, so it's comparing here to a single time series station with chlorophyll, and you can see that the general seasonal cycle matches fairly well. But as well as validating these, we can start to do some science with them. So, as I say, we can split phytoplankton up into different functional types. Their size is very important. One thing you can do is just split them up into small, medium, and large. Or since we're dealing with microscopic organisms, pico, nano, and micro. And you can do this from observations and from the model. So we had a look at this from our model. So here you have a kind of triangular color bar. So because of three size classes, the fraction for them must always add up to one. You can plot them as a triangle. So basically, if you plot them in the middle, there are equal amounts of the three size classes. If you plot um, at the far bottom corner, it's entirely microphytoplankton, and similarly for nanoplankton, picoplankton. So you can see the community structure on one plot. And we have here the August mean for two years from the reanalysis plotted in the background for the North Sea, and overlaid with that is some in situ observations, which are the dots. And we can compare the model to the in situ observations and Frankly, the model's not very good. You, it's not getting it very right at all. But, this, but as we've heard, just because the model is wrong doesn't necessarily mean it's not useful. And so what we're trying to do here is something very detailed and specific, so kind of site-specific um, simulation or phytoplankton community structure in a model which doesn't even have ocean colour assimilation, and we just can't do that. However, you will notice some things, hopefully it comes up on the projector. So if you look at the central North Sea in the two years, they look very different in the model between the two years. And similarly in the observations, they look very different between the two years. And so even if we're not getting the exact community structure, we are getting the fact that there is interannual variability in a region. In this case, we can link it to changes in the winds, changing the mixing of the mixed layer depth, which changes the ecosystem interactions. And so even if we can't specifically say here at this place and time, we have this community structure, we can say between these years, under these different conditions, you will likely see a change in five plankton community structure and therefore potentially a change for fisheries. And this kind of highlights the importance of understanding where your model is and isn't skillful, the kind of products it can and can't provide, kind of products your users do and don't want, and presenting them in such a way that they are useful, whilst over time the science improves, the skill of these forecasts improves, and we can get more specific forecasts. And then, so we, 
We've got a reanalysis from Northwest Shelf. Plymouth Marine Laboratory have run their own reanalysis of the same region with ocean color data simulation. They looked at various things, including with uncertainties, looking at where over the period of 1998 to 2010 you might expect to see hypoxia and oxygen deficiency, and that can be useful for, again, planning purposes, understanding how changing environment might impact fish, and with our sparse biochemical observations, we can't really get this information from observation so well. So that shell thief at the Met Office, we also run reanalysis for the global ocean, this time with ocean color data simulation, which I'll talk about tomorrow. We do this with a kind of simpler haddock model, but again, coupled online to NEMO. And the focus of the global ocean is more on understanding variability in the carbon cycle and how that might relate to understanding climate change. So you can start to see how different variables, here we've got um, chlorophyll on top left, sea surface temperature and air sea CO2 flux co-vary with each other and also how they change with various different climate drivers. So you see here the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index affecting the tropical Pacific and the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. And you can see various variability here, but probably the most interannual variability that stands out is in the air sea CO2 flux in the tropical Pacific, which varies quite a lot depending on whether you have El Nino or La Nina. And you can probably see this more clearly in a line plot. So we've averaged each month the air sea CO2 flux over the tropical Pacific. Plotted in black is a climatology, just kind of repeating year after year. And then the red is a model reanalysis. And you can see a lot of interannual variability, which syncs up quite well with the ENSO index. And this is largely driven by changes in upwelling. So you get more upwelling during La Nina, which brings a lot more carbon up to the surface of the ocean that can be exchanged with the atmosphere. Though there's also a smaller biological component as well, which we can come look at to try and separate out. OK, so that's my first lecture. I've got a slightly bland summary, which is that operational biochemistry is obviously less mature than physics, but is of an increasing focus for a number of operational centres. And it's of importance to a range of applications, particularly in coastal regions where we, you know, people are getting in the water and where most of the fisheries are, but also on global scale, considering prime production and the carbon cycle, and right through from five-day forecast seasonal predictions to climate projections. And there is a lot of exciting science to be done for anyone wanting a bit of a challenge. Some of these challenges selected slightly arbitrarily, so select the appropriate model complexity, whether you want a really simple model or a more complex model, will depend a little bit on your point of view of which is better, but mostly on which is most appropriate for the question at hand, the type of environment you're trying to simulate, and similarly the, how you want to model the processes and the resolution as well. So the physical models are increasingly going to higher and higher resolution and using up all the computing resources by themselves. So how do we couple these even more expensive biochemical models to them? Then try and separate out where the errors are coming from. Because we're modeling things as passive traces, small errors in kind of vertical mixing can produce large errors in the biochemistry. So we want to understand what errors are coming from our biochemical model, which are coming from our physical model, so we can fix them appropriately. And also, a biochemist can go to physical modelers and say, you know this vertical mixing scheme that you didn't really care too much about? Well, we care. Please try and improve it. And yeah, so because it's less mature, the forecast skill isn't as great yet as for physics, 
but there is useful skill there, so we want to understand where that skill is and what scales, and alongside that, try and characterize the uncertainty with that, and really engage with end users to find out what they want to know, what would be useful to them, and how it would be useful to present it to them, because you probably want more detailed products such as kind of habitat map and just a map of sea surface temperature, for instance. We also want to try and link to end-to-end -end ecosystem models. So these are models which try and go all the way from physics to biochemistry to fish, all the way up to humans, simulate everything that you know, might be useful to fisheries and the ecosystem. And it's not clear how best to do that and how the operational physical biochemical community can feed into that. And then, of course, data simulation, which I will talk about tomorrow. Thank you.